Okay, all right. Well, thanks a lot, Nick. I guess we're holding you guys hostage for uh, dessert, which seems a little bit uh, cruel and unusual punishment, but we'll try to, uh, try to get some interesting conversation going. So I hope, like all of you, you've been kind of enjoying the day, learning a lot of stuff about this fascinating uh, digital economy. And so we're going to continue the conversation here by focusing on millennials and focusing on content. So what is it we can learn from millennials? Why is content so important and so on? So I'll give a sort of one minute intro of myself and then we'll run down the panel. We have Jennifer, we have Mike, and we have Vince. We'll let them introduce themselves. We have some questions we're gonna go through and then just to make it kind of fun and interactive, we're gonna take some questions from the floor with about 15 minutes to go and then we'll dive back into their, their uh, into our, I was gonna say into our research. I can't help myself as an academic. <laughs> into our dessert, okay. So uh, as Nick said, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania at the Wharton School and um, focused on a class I teach on digital marketing and e-commerce. And my main area of expertise is really in the startup and retail space. I work a lot with companies like Warby Parker, Bonobos, uh, Harry's and those kind of companies. Some of those companies were students in my class, which I was kind of in awe of those, uh, those guys. So brands that really started in the digital economy, and we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. So that's me. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and then over to, uh, to Mike and to Vince to introduce themselves, and then we'll kick it off with some questions and roll through. So Jennifer, please. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Um, I, I met many of you. I come um, from Fender Digital in Los Angeles. I'm tasked with starting up a digital business for a fender of 70 year old uh, American iconic brand of guitar makers. Uh, previous to that though, I started my career as a music journalist writing for print magazine a long time ago when people read magazines and stuff. Since then I've been working in content as it's now called other than journalism and um, I switched over to a uh, product a couple years ago. Um, when I realized that content isn't just within that two-thirds well, it's the whole experience, so that's me. Uh, my name's Mike Spadier. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Onnit.com. <clears throat> uh, what we do at Onnit is uh, health and fitness lifestyle. So we make supplements, health foods, and um, uh, fitness equipment. And uh, Content is a huge part of what we do. Um, the fitness and, and health uh, space in general is, is really commoditized. So you, have to, so you have to come up with ways of differentiating yourself. So content is uh, a really strong part of what we do. I'm Vince Rico. I'm the chief digital officer for Trusted Media Brands. Uh, I have, my background is uh, sort of multidisciplinary in that I've been uh, in financial services with startups and most recently uh, in publishing, um, always on the marketing and the technical product development side of things. Uh, and Trusted Media Brands uh, has both a book publishing and a magazine publishing business. Uh, we have about uh, 12 titles on our magazine uh, publishing side, the most well-known is probably Reader's Digest, and I will say that we have over 30% of our online audience is millennials. Surprising fact. Yeah, that is surprising. Okay. <laughs> All right, so since the title of our, uh, our session today is Tapping Into Millennials, Why Interactive Content is Priceless, I'm going to kick off in a second by starting with uh, Vince. And just to maybe to tell us as we run down the panel uh, in reverse order, uh, why are millennials so important? Like, what can we learn from millennials? And sort of, who is this group? We often hear that, you know, millennials are the people of sort of the future. They grow up with the remote control for their lives. They're kind of digitally native. And so, apparently, we should be looking at this group. So, who is the millennial? Why is the millennial important? And then we'll kind of run down the, the panel. Uh, so, the, for, for us, uh, the millennial is important for a variety of reasons. On the uh, customer side of things, uh, one of the things Reader's Digest has always been known for is curating content and, um, uh, and user-generated content. So if any of you are familiar with the old print product, which is still a print, <laughs> the, uh, that's, how, that's how the magazine got started. It was really uh, looking across the print landscape, uh, culling uh, the, what they thought were the best articles and or stories, and, print, and then collecting user-generated content, mostly in the form of jokes and short stories, uh, and putting that together into a magazine. So uh, what, we've, what we've discovered online is that that, for 
formula is, is actually very interesting to millennials. And uh, it, does anyone here know uh, TLDR, what that means? Yes. Yeah. Too so, long didn't read. Too long didn't read. So what we, uh, <laughs> that hashtag has uh, been associated with our content now uh, for, for many, many years. And it's interesting that, the, uh, that this group of people who uh, either don't know the brand or only know the brand uh, as, their, as the magazine that they saw uh, in their grandmother's house, um, they're actually coming to the site, they're finding the content interesting uh, and useful and interacting with us on many levels. So we have a large uh, Facebook audience, uh, we have a large presence uh, on Pinterest and uh, Instagram, um, on, on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is probably our, our largest following for that title. And what we find is that that title becomes uh, various times an entryway for uh, that group of people then to discover our other content, uh, some of which is in uh, The Family Handyman, which is all about uh, fixing your home. And as that group of people are currently buying their first homes, they're very interested. They may not have the money to hire outside people. They're very interested in doing it yourself, sort of they, part of the makers movement that's happening in the US. And they see some of our titles uh, as entryways into their other interests. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. And so we'll continue the discussion by thinking about also why is content important. So we're going to start that with Jennifer in a moment. But Mike, um, how do you think about uh, millennials when you're in the health and wellness space? Do millennials care about health and wellness? Do you target them directly? What's the. They do. Um, the trick is, though, millennials are pretty savvy when it comes to being marketed to. So it's, it's a very kind of fine line that you have to walk where, you know, uh, as a marketer, you have conversations where we say we need to create content, we need to create um, articles and things like that for millennials to digest. But the challenge is if you do it with that as your compass, you're going to fail every time. So what you have to do is you have to create content for the sake of value first. And as long as you stick to that, uh, millennials will not call you out on, on BS. And that's really, that's really the trick is they're really good at, at knowing when they're being marketed to, they're really good at knowing when it's BS content, and God forbid, if they find out that you're putting out BS content, they're gonna tell each other and you're gonna be branded pretty quick. Um, so first and foremost, always have content that's gonna be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, so maybe before we get to uh, Jennifer, when we come back to you guys, we're gonna start with Mike next time. If you give us an example of content that you've created that really resonated, uh, with millennials, and also if you guys uh, have a war story as well, content that you created that you thought was going to be great. So I think most of us here in the room, you know, we've watched Gangnam Style, we've seen the Ice Bucket Challenge, and you might have this little alarm that goes off, you know, why is it that certain kind of content resonates and certain kind of content tanks, whether it's commercial content or whether it's more authentic content and so on. So sort of the good and the bad, uh, we'll get to that in a second, but Jill uh, Jennifer, how do you think about millennials, particularly as it relates to content? So. What I think about millennials is why would we look at that generation more significantly than any other? And I was thinking about sort of the, the like I was talking about the evolution of content where we started, I started um, when we took magazines and put them online. Um, when I started in print, there was a definition, there was a strong line between what we call church versus state or editorial versus advertorial. And we didn't cross those lines, but as we've evolved the uh, web content experience, it's been very cloudy. So to your point, well, you have to be authentic. Well, well, of course you have to be authentic. That's what journalism was. So it's just interesting to see that this millennial um, generation understands inherently that there has to be credibility. They don't read magazines or newspapers like we did, but they still understand where is that content coming from? Who is it targeting and why, why is it value to me? So I look at it as not a millennial, but as a generation who is now entering this sort of content sphere and how are they consuming it? And how can I reach them without being inauthentic, without convoluting those messages and being clear and offering their value in a way that they expect it? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. One thing you read a lot in the press is how, I think as Mike said, you know, millennials will kind of tune you out if they detect any sort of sense of inauthenticity. What's also interesting, I think, picking up from the panel here is 
kind of what's old uh, is new again. Uh, so I mentioned earlier one of the companies I work with, Bonobos, one of their most effective customer acquisition channels is actually the catalog, because no one ever sends catalogs. And so the fact that it shows up then creates this other what's engagement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Can maybe just continu <laughs> continuing this theme, uh, we'll start with you, Mike, and then go to Vince on you know, content that's really worked and then content that's tanked, and what were the insights that you, that you got from that? Well, uh, in, in my experience in you know, kind of the broad strokes of content, what works is value. Uh, you know, for, for, for on it with what we're doing, um, health and wellness. So if we're pitching something like a workout routine, if we're pitching something like a diet guide or recipes or anything like that, it's very hard to not get on board with that type of stuff because it's aspirational, right? Our whole brand is aspirational. Everything that we push is how to be a better version of yourself. So, I mean, it's almost cheating in a sense that we're not going to put something out that isn't going to at least resonate with someone because yeah, everyone wants to be better. Yeah, and this may be more of a challenge when we open it up to the audience. You know, we're having a conversation over dinner. Some of our colleagues are selling insurance. You know, that may be a less compelling story. And so maybe one question, uh, yeah. not to seed table eight, you know, for the panel later on, <laughs> um, is, you know, if you have content that you feel is less exciting, there's less aspirational, less inherently has a grab to it, um, then how do you create content that's going to have a message that people actually care about? So we may come to that later on. So yeah, Mike. So I'll tell you um, one piece of content or one strategy that we tried uh, that failed miserably um, was we were getting we were getting a ton of traction with some of the articles and some of the recipes and things like that. Like I said, and uh, it kind of naturally progressed into journalism. So we were kind of ramping up each article or each each piece a little bit more and more and. And so we said, all right, let's make a commentary about uh, the state of kettlebell, right? Kettle, for those of you who don't know, kettlebell is a type of uh, fitness equipment. Oh, yeah, and you've got to tell them what, uh, so uh, Mike mentioned something really interesting at the, the panel this morning about the kettlebells that you're launching. You want to tell the, the dinner crew? So, yeah, one of the things that we do at On It uh, that kind of put us on the map is we have this line of, of kettlebells that are artistically sculpted. They're, they're called the primal bells, and so there's one that looks like a, a chimp and then one that looks like a gorilla. And, and <laughs> And the, the, the rock, most famously, swings our, our uh, Bigfoot kettlebell. <laughs> if you follow the rock on Instagram, that's, that's us. Um, anyway, so one of, the, one of the things that we failed at was um, we tried to take on this, this whole kind of uh, journalistic approach on, on this kettlebell cold war is what we called it. Because kettlebells originated in, in Russia you know, 50 years ago or something that was kind of their secret weapon for training. And there's two different styles on lifting it over your head or lifting it straight forward. And so we built this whole article with interviews from master trainers and videos and demonstrations. And we had this, uh, we had this really, really cool New York Times interactive article that we were using as kind of our model and said, look how good content can be online. You know, they had this whole thing, I forgot what it was, but it was about uh, some shipping industry thing. And if you were reading the article, it broke up the article in the middle with, with uh, sounds of like the ocean and, and you know you could hear like the ship rocking and stuff and it was really immersive and so we said that's what we want to do that's the future of what we want to do and so we spent probably two or three weeks on this article you know had an insane amount of, of uh, uh, content and an insane amount of interactive content to it and we put it out and it just absolutely flopped <laughs> none of our people gave two shits about <laughs> the state of kettlebells in Russia versus the United States, <laughs> right? And we thought it was so clever and we were so proud of ourselves and we put it out there and it just tanked. And so the next week it was back to, you know, five workouts to lose two inches <laughs> on your waistline. <laughs> and that's what works. Interesting, fantastic, <laughs> great anecdote, fantastic. Thanks, Mike. So Vince, what, what have you seen that's worked really well with this group and also you've had problems with? The, the things that have worked well um, and it's different depending on the title, but uh, for Reader's Digest, this, some of the things that have worked well um, are our joke section, um, which we continue to rank um, in search uh, number one or number two if you're searching for, for jokes, and that hmm. seems to play well. <laughs> this is <laughs> really real, informative. Right? <laughs> I mean, who knew? You know, aren't you guys glad you came to dinner? Now you know if you need jokes. Go to the Reader's Digest. Indeed, and they're all family-friendly jokes, I might, I might add. <laughs> um, 
So, um, and, and that humor, and w w one of the things we found is that, that that humor plays well across all of oh. our audiences, but um, it, particularly with the millennials who uh, seem to be driving uh, that part of the site in particular. Um, other things that we didn't expect to do well were more long form kinds of content where um, we uh, had an article written by uh, a woman who uh, posed as someone who wanted to join ISIS and she started a relationship, an online dialogue or conversation with, uh, with someone from ISIS and then she ended up writing about that and it was a fairly extensive uh, online article. And um, that one ended up being, we did not, that was not necessarily targeted to, to millennials, but that ended up being mm. uh, wildly popular with, uh, with that age group mm. in particular. Um, where we've been less successful is uh, on one of our, one of our websites, um, or one of our, our properties called Taste of Home, which is both a magazine and a, and a website, uh, where we tried the, the, pre the basic premise of most of the recipes are the users will submit them based on uh, their grandmother's recipe for something or their mother's recipe for something. Um, and a, a large number of the recipes end up being things like uh, buy a, this prepared item and combine it with this other prepared item and this other prepared <laughs> item and put it in the microwave. So the whole thing <laughs> takes five to 10 minutes. And um, when we have uh, got, and a lot of that stuff is uh, stuff that the millennials recognize as stuff that their moms made or their grandmoms made, so they are happy with that content. When we tried to have our test kitchen come up with those kinds of recipes, uh, they, they failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, inevitably don't, they just don't ring true. They don't have that same authenticity. And our chefs in the test kitchen are all classic cordon bleu, classically trained chefs who are very good at, uh, in the kitchen, taking people's recipes and testing them, but when they're coming up with things, it just doesn't have that same kind of authenticity. Okay, very we, interesting. We in failed doing the same thing. In fact, um, you know, what Vince was saying is also well supported by academic research. There's a professor at MIT, Catherine Tucker, did a really interesting study where she looked at all of the advertising content that was not only most likely to go viral, but also most likely to be persuasive. And what she found is sometimes content that goes more viral has certain properties, like it shocks people and it provokes people so they share it, but it's less likely to engage them and to persuade them. And so if you think of content attributes in terms of a Venn diagram, what's right at the center that promotes both virality but also engagement, there's only two characteristics. One is positive humor, so it's interesting to hear Vince uh, talk about that. The other one is having a very high quality aesthetic or a feel. So if you have content that's both um, aesthetically pleasing, either in terms of visual or in terms of writing, and also humorous, that seems to be the silver bullet that will do those two things for you. So, great, thanks Vince. So we'll move now on to Jennifer, who has a long association with content, so maybe you want to give us a little bit of a perspective on that association. Also tell us, you know, what works and what doesn't, be it with millennials or other groups that you're, you're working with. Well, um, I think, like, thematically we're saying that TLDR really rang true somewhere around, like, the mid-2005, 2006, when I realized that, again, we're not taking newspaper articles and magazine articles and putting them on the web because nobody's going to read all of that. Um, so how do we uh, convey these messages? So what we started doing um, when I was at Live Nation, previous defender, was our joke in the content team was like, we're gonna eradicate the written word, which we were being funny, but really what we were doing was just making everything visual, whether it was videos or photo galleries, presenting um, you know, this show don't tell um, ethos to everything we do so that while you're gonna see everything 12 hottest things that happened on stage last night, um, we'll put the words as a caption and you'll scroll down or you'll click through a video gallery and you'll look at things associated with that content. And I would never present any content without a visual. I mean, to this day, like that to me is like, why would you have paragraphs of words? Ew, <laughs> gross. You know, it <laughs> has to have a visual representation. Otherwise, is it a millennial thing or is it a human thing? I don't know, but people huh. respond visually. Very interesting. So this is going to lead us into the next series of questions where we want to think about the people who are involved, the channels who are involved, and also the kind of execution. So uh, somebody said this recently in a uh, meeting like this that I was in, so I can't give the proper attribution, but 
uh, I think it was John, a fellow called John Dayton at Harvard, he said, um, really interesting point about the millennial generation and also the digital economy is even your audience has an audience. And so the idea that you, know, you put some content out there, it's received by somebody, and then they may sh share it, they may send it, they may do something to it. So this idea of the audience having an audience. So have you guys found in your interaction with millennials, and maybe we'll start uh, with Mike and then come back to Jennifer, um, are there per certain individuals who become very important in your content space that you try to seed or you notice people attach to content that then they share it or they modify it or they do something that's either beneficial or not uh, to the brand? Yeah, um, you know, we've been really fortunate since we started the brand. Um, you know, you hear people say things like thought leaders or tip of the spear all the time. And when we first started the brand, uh, Trying to get those people in the beginning is very, very difficult. Um, but if you're able to resonate with someone who has an audience, um, if you stick with it, you can kind of use that person to leverage someone else you know, down the road. And so what we've, what we've been able to do over the years is kind of, without sounding too crass, like we've been able to kind of trade up for each of our influencers. <laughs> And that's um, a great, like, hopefully no one's tweeting that out, but yeah, isn't that a great that, phrase? Like trade up your influences. <laughs> you, know, that's, uh, uh, you know, in a way. So, you know, <laughs> our, I think our first, I think our first quote unquote celebrity that was endorsing our brand was a professional video game player. And at the time, professional video games were nothing. And still this guy never really made that big of a name for himself. But three or four years down the road, as more and more people kind of get on board with that, uh, we got to the point, you know, last year, like I mentioned, The Rock posted a, a, a Instagram video of him swinging our kettlebell completely unprovoked. I mean, we sent him a kettlebell and that was it. We didn't have to, you know, make a deal with him or say, hey, hashtag this or blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, when you talk about your audience's audiences, The Rock's following on Instagram is, you know, 7 million people yeah. or something. Yeah. So... I mean, it kind of starts with good product and it kind of starts with, with, with relationship building, but if you can make it stick, it can be big. Great, fantastic. Ben. So um, one of the things we do um, on Reader's Digest in particular and in different ways on some of the other sites is we have a section of uh, quotes by uh, famous people and at different times there, uh, we try to always choose uh, living people. And uh, in one, one of our print editions, we had, uh, in the comedy edition, uh, we had a, a, a whole section of quotes from famous living comedians. And uh, we then tweeted that uh, from, uh, from our Reader's Digest Twitter account. And the, retweets that we got from those comedians um, was beyond our, our wildest dreams in terms of uh, reach and then drawing people uh, to, to, to the site and, and uh, to the content. Um, in a slightly different way, on, on our, because we do use a lot of user-generated content, both on the, on the rest or across the recipe site, the, uh, family Handyman, the, the DIY sites, um, et cetera. Uh, what we find is that it attracts a certain kind of uh, uh, person who submits that kind of content and often, uh, particularly if they're submitting it online as opposed to through the mail, which we still accept, uh, they often have followings and they're very uh, happy to say, oh, check out my recipe or my recipe got tested in the test kitchen and you know, and that sort of thing, and that becomes another uh, viral way. And the same with the DIY stuff, where people will say, "Oh, I really liked your plan for making this park bench for my backyard," and then I did this to it, and uh, or you know whatever, and then they start submitting that, and uh, and that has sort of it that starts to take on a life of its own in terms of how that gets redistributed and uh, brings new people in and changes the conversation. And in fact. One of the most interesting ones, uh, one of the most interesting projects we had uh, that went wildly viral for the family handyman was uh, a project where um, a, you could take uh, like a wire rack 
and put it in in your kitchen cupboard to create this like a, a place to store cans where you could see them all sort of lined up. So instead of having them sort of all behind each other where you couldn't see them. And um, it's, I know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it was I, I the funniest that. project in, in, in a way. And it went hugely viral. And what was so interesting is it was really divided into two camps of people who said, Honey, this is what I need. This is, uh, or you know, uh, honey, I'm making this for you so you can find your stuff and blah blah. blah. And people were totally loved the idea, and people who were completely anti the idea. They said that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Why can't you just open your cupboards and find your cans? Like who are you? Um, and but because of that strange controversy around how to see your canned goods, um, the thing went absolutely viral. Like in and people took it and, uh, and, and it also then became, wh what was most interesting was people started to make jokes out of it. Like what else can you, what else are you like not finding in your cupboards and whatever. <laughs> and it was, uh, and it sort of took on a life of its own. Yeah, I, th I think what's fascinating from the conversation so far, and then we'll, we'll turn to Jennifer for the closer on this particular question is, again, there's a lot of research that suggests in practice, you would take a company like Sephora, what they've done with Beauty Insider is if you kind of provide a steel rails to the customers and you just give them the opportunity to converse, the way in which they help each other and before Sephora can even give you know, Jennifer a tip about a certain mascara, somebody else in Austin, Texas has already taken on that, uh, that role, I think is really interesting. And then I also think both uh, Mike and Vince raised this notion of um, these, these important influences and they tend to be people who are not necessarily the most famous. There's a, an interesting academic study called the Million Follower Fallacy. And the whole point of that study is the people you want to engage for your brand are typically people who are very, very authentic, that have highly engaged, highly connected users. They're not necessarily the people with the most quote unquote followers. They're the people who have the most engaged, uh, emotionally engaged uh, people behind them. So somebody like Reed Drummond, who's the pioneer woman, she's the perfect person to promote Land of Lakes Butter, you know, not uh, Jessica Simpson, let's say. So yeah, great stuff, guys. All right, so we'll let Jennifer fin finish this one and then we'll start into platforms with Jennifer. So Jennifer. So when I think about sharing, um, I haven't really targeted specific influencers, but uh, what I've come to sort of find was that when someone shares an article or a video or some piece of content, it's not about the article or content subject, it's about the emotion. So, so what, what, when I talk, think about content development, what emotion am I tapping into? Is it humor? Is it anger? Is it um, lust or aspiration? What's the emotion? Because that will compel somebody to hit that share button and share it with their friends on some level, whether it's to incite them or to evoke an, uh, some sort of emotion or to, to make them cry or laugh. So I feel like at every pinnacle, every article should have some sort of overarching goal of what's the emotional value here? What, it, what are you trying to convey? What, if you want it shared, why would somebody share it? Will it make you laugh or cry or somewhere in between? So that's kind of how I think of it. Okay, fantastic. So we're gonna do, oh yeah, Vince, I go ahead. I just wanna add one thing yeah, please. that I thought was very interesting to, uh, to add on to what you're saying. I was uh, recently talking to some folks over at BuzzFeed and one of the things that was fascinating to me was that uh, they actually hired an epidemiologist to study uh, how uh, things get shared and what are some of the, the uh, things that go into sharing. And it includes many of the things you said, um, as well as many huh. of the things that you alluded to earlier, David, in terms of like, what um, uh, is it, uh, is it something personal and private for me or is it something that I can share because it's humor or shocking or one of those other things. Um, but the map of sharing very much follows uh, epidemiological hmm. uh, maps. Yeah. Very, fa very interesting. Fascinating. So, so thanks, Vince. So, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to pose one final question, well, really two questions, and then open up to you guys so we still have dessert. You know, Kiwis are not really known for being on time, but I'm going to be you know, <laughs> bang on time, 9.30, we get our dessert. So we're going to ask the question now about channels, and then I'm going to ask the panel, each member of the panel, to give us as a collective audience, you know, a couple of tips about how we should think about content. So for example, what Jennifer said, you know, really powerful, we should be thinking about what is the emotion that we're trying to activate, and that may be one of the tips that, uh, that she's going to give. So just also to add to what uh, Vince said about epidemiology, if you see great content, stuff like, you know, Mike Dubin at Dollar Shave Club, 
uh, you know, that's really clever because it takes a consumption of a product that's inherently private. I'm not going to say, well, of course not to Mike, but I'm not going to say to Vince, you look very clean, clean shaven, you know, what products have you been using? So <laughs> using content as a way to create social visibility for products that people are not going to talk about, I think is a really interesting sort of notion to think about too. So let's start with, um, with Jennifer on the, on the second to last question, which is the channel. So we're all confronted with this sort of plethora of you know, Snapchat and Instagram and Vine and whatever the other new things are going to be here in the next six months. How do you think about um, the right way, if there is a right way, to deploy those kind of channels? And so we'll start with you and just, just run down the line. So. That's, well, that's a good question. Um, and, well, I, and I don't have the answer, <laughs> um, unfortunately. So you've got Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube. So we on the Fender side are addressing them all as separate channels. They all have separate voices. They all have separate mediums. and. How do you best um, activate each channel appropriately is hard. Um, I, and I, I, again, I don't have the answer. You know, you think of Facebook as an, an older demographic. We joke and call it the, the you know, the, the Heaven's Way Station or the online retirement <laughs> community where Snapchat, that's where my son is activating constantly, who's 16 years old. So um, how do we reach that market and how do we, uh, maintain the shredders, the, the 60 year old lawyer who has a collection of Fender guitars on his wall versus the kid who just wants to create a loop so he can put it into Pro Tools and create his new dubstep, whatever. Um, so <laughs> it's this ongoing challenge that we have to, to reach out with authenticity, with emotion, in the right place, in the right space. So um, if, if you guys have the answer, enlighten <laughs> me because okay. I need to know. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, Mike. Uh, the short answer is be everywhere. So if there's, if there's a where should you be and where should you not be, the, question, the answer is just be everywhere. I mean, you're talking about you know, the difference between having someone who runs social media and if that guy's maxed out, get another person. Like this is, it's, it's, not, it's not so hard that you shouldn't be everywhere that you possibly can be. The trick is each one of those channels has a sweet spot and has a very particular voice and a very particular way of using that channel. Um, and it definitely does not cross over. So if you're using the same strategy on Twitter and just in reposting what you're doing on Twitter and Facebook, it's gonna fall on deaf ears. If you're taking an article that you're posting to uh, you know, your content blog or whatever and then pinning an image to Pinterest, it's, it's gonna be dead, you know, I think mentioning uh, Family Handyman is a perfect example. I'm, I'm a huge fan of that um, Pinterest channel because the way that they post the content is it'll put you right in the middle of a, of a project and that image is gonna get your attention immediately or it's not. Um, and then you click through and then you realize that it's you know this whole step-by-step -step process and you're in. And then hopefully you subscribe, which I did. Um, <laughs> For Snapchat in particular, there's a, there's a very, very interesting thing happening with Snapchat that you know, uh, users, individuals are, are, are getting and they're, they're sending back and forth to each other and then also to their own personal story, their day-to-day -day, uh, story. So for those of you who aren't familiar, it's only a 24-hour window that your stuff that you post is up. But a really interesting opportunity for brands because if you've got a captive audience and you've got a, a really strong customer base that's, that's you know, hanging on your, your every whim to see what you're gonna do next, you can utilize that platform to do some really interesting things. So let's say you're rolling out a new product. Um, go to the factory and Snapchat five seconds of it coming down one piece of the assembly line and then another five seconds of it until you know, your entire day until you finally have that product in the packaging delivering it straight to the warehouse, right? Or even the warehouse boxing it up and going out the door. And, you know, you're talking about a very niche audience, but if someone's actually following you on that process, I mean, that's the coolest content in the world, mm -hmm. right? So, so the takeaway is you're not gonna be able to do that on Facebook. If you condense that into one, you know, mashup video, no one cares, right? Uh, you may be able to take a frame from that and post it to Pinterest, or you may be able to write an article about that and put it on your blog, but really, the right way to do it is, is figure out the messaging and the methodology for each one of those channels and stay at it. Great, all right, thanks Mike. Thanks. And I, I agree 
I completely agree with what Mike said, and uh, I would add to that, um, the, I guess I would reinforce the stick with it because there's nothing worse for your brand than to look like you have an abandoned channel uh, that makes it feel like and look like your brand uh, is out of the market. Um, and the other piece I would say is uh, it's a test and learn process. So you, um, we've, we have not yet uh, gone on Snapchat or we've toyed around with Snapchat a little bit, mostly because um, we've not been able to see an ROI um, in Snapchat. Snapchat is probably a little bit younger than, uh, than the audience that we're ideally after. Um, but uh, it is one that I would say we'll need to figure out because I think, and it's also one that's rapidly morphing if you look at uh, all the changes that they're making and uh, allowing publishers like, like ourselves to, to monetize in different ways. Um, so I, I'm sure that uh, we'll figure it out, but um, it's probably one of those channels that, that it's not going away anytime soon, and that group of people will age into our target market and will uh, need to be where they, where they are. Um, it's an interesting point, too, about sort of jumping in and then jumping out, but it kind of makes you look bad. Yeah. Because uh, I guess everything you do, in some sense, is socially <laughs> visible, and so if you ramp down, there's maybe potentially a reputational uh, effect there. So before we sort of let the, the panelists kind of give their one to two top highlights of the must-do, I think we've already had a lot of great insights coming out of the group. There's a lot of experience here on the, uh, on the platform and a lot of variation in what the team is doing. We're going to turn it over to you guys. If there are one or two burning questions that people want to ask before we uh, <laughs> close it out and have our dessert. So anyone from any of the tables? Yeah, the lady at the front here. Uh, we, we'll get a mic so that everyone else can hear the, the question too. And just tell us who you're directing the question to. So. Um, well, I'm going to direct it to my teacher, my boss, who's going to talk to my teacher, yeah. Mr. Brian. But, you know, I'm curious to hear what you, your strategy for channels different. But I'm a little bit interested in your sort of crowd sharing model. Like, do you plan to create a video Okay, great question. Who yeah. wants to tackle that first? Anyone want to go first? Go ahead. Me? Yeah. <laughs> Video is a, is a great um, new content medium. I don't mean it's new, but it's where everything has evolved to in the last 12 months so that all of our video is now, all of our content now is being generated via video. So um, YouTube, of course, is the place to put it. So of course, you're in, each brand should have their um, YouTube channel and a multi-channel and then bringing in content through there. Um, but as far as how, how does that content convey to Facebook or to Vine or to wherever else you're putting it, um, I think that um, as long as that video content um, caters to, again, the, the quality, the authenticity, but also at that YouTube level so that it's shared from there, because I feel like that's the portal, at least for now, where everyone is consuming and coming to find um, video content. Everything from how to um, organize your soup cans to how to learn to play bar chords. You know, it's all there. You have to be there. Yeah, great. Fantastic. You guys want to add anything to that? Or? Just that one of the nice things you can do, um, you know, if you, make, if you make video first and foremost for YouTube. So that's, that's where you build the, the long form. Um, you can take your 15-second clip of the best part of that, that video or the most engaging part or the most visual part of it, um, condense it, and then create a 15-second clip for Instagram. And then what you can do is, uh, let's, say, let's say your Instagram following is, is, is much stronger than your YouTube following. Well, now you've got this teaser clip to drive people to your YouTube channel or vice versa. Um, you know, that is kind of going back on what I said earlier, that is a piece that you could figure out if something's sticky to drive something to one of your other channels. Great, fantastic, all right. I want to turn it to uh, Vincent if you want to say anything else, we'll turn to another, yeah, the gentleman, uh, Nate there. Yeah. Table eight, coming through, coming through, good stuff. Sure. Nate. <laughs>
tackle that one, Vince? Or? Sure. Um, so as a publisher, it's uh, paid, uh, probably plays a very different role uh, for us than uh, for, for non-publishers. Uh, there are, you know, we, the, we use paid uh, strategically. And because the way we monetize most of our content is through advertising, uh, as, as well as subscriptions, but primarily advertising, um, advertisers, uh, when they look at how, how, what, how you're getting your users, uh, they don't want to see too many paid visitors to your site because then they feel like, well, I could just go out and buy those visitors myself. Why should I have to pay you to pay someone to come to your site? So, um, so but, but we do use paid strategically exactly for the reason that you mentioned, in order to uh, like write out some of those algorithmic ways. So anytime Google uh, makes a change, um, w depending on the site and depending on the change, we either get a huge gain or a huge loss. It's rarely neutral. When Facebook mm -hmm. made some of their algorithmic changes, um, same thing, like some of our uh, pages got a huge boost and some uh, got it, took a huge hit. And, uh, that, and that's when we come in and use uh, paid sort of strategically to bolster some of our numbers so we can reformulate or re-figure out what our strategy should be to, uh, to go uh, uh, to maximize that, that particular channel. Um, and on our acquisition side, our, our uh, subscriber acquisition side, um, we depend heavily on the content anyway, so there's a whole content marketing piece uh, that uh, is just driving the subscribers. Uh, and then there we're using paid very, very differently to, to drive subscribers, not in most of those channels that, that, that non-publishers are probably using. Great. All right. Thanks a lot, Vince. I think we've got time because um, we're going to end on the dot at uh, it's, uh, 9.30. So we have a gentleman here. Question. Let's focus on the marketing So is the question uh, attribution to, to track sales from, from content? Uh, <laughs> short answer is um, judge it against other content, but you're never gonna have 100% accuracy on what's driving what. Um, so, you know, if, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna have your content strategy or your social media strategy or whatever be 100% revolving around ROI, you're going to fail. Um, it's just, it's just too hard to track back hundred uh, percent. You have to use a combination of metrics. You have to kind of come up with what works best for your brand, a uh, combination of shares, page views, likes, revenue, and then whatever that formula is, just use that formula and gauge everything against that. Cause it's never going to be dollars to donuts. I, I agree completely. Yeah. And, you know, um, there's that famous quote from David Ogilvy, uh, I think, who said, you know, 50% of my marketing spend doesn't work. I just don't know which 50%. I, <laughs> people have often said, oh, well, that's going to go away in the digital age because we can track so much better and so much more. But, but um, the truth is, uh, I don't think that that will ever go away just because you don't know what, which is the final thing to attribute something to. So they may have seen or, um, a piece of content uh, or multiple pieces of content in different places, but you never know which is the one that actually drove them to take a, a specific action, or it's very hard to ultimately uh, uh, find that particularly if they have been exposed to multiple things. Jennifer, you want to add? Well, agreed. You know, it, it's hard to track that. I, I read I read a content article about a particular brand or a particular item and then um, related products or um, in my articles, for example, if I'm talking about um, 
some guitar player, I will underneath and attach hashtags within the CMS that then push in those products that that, whether it's the Edge or Flea or whoever is playing, get the sound, you know, like um, you, you can have this. So can I relate conversion to this? No, but likely they will look at those products. I see the engagement, but I don't often see the conversion at that point. So how do you monitor that? Usually I use engagement or um, how many clicks, how much time on site, those sorts of um, brand pushing things other than conversion, because to all our points, it's really hard to track. Yeah, so I think it's actually a great question from Rex to kind of close out our discussion for now. Hopefully we'll continue over dessert and, uh, and over drink, but the age old issue of attribution, you know, we're all in the marketing game, we still have to do it, we have to believe in our brand, we have to create great content, we have to activate it, we have to think about, to, to Mike's point, metrics around ROI, but even doing all of that, um, because behavior is you know, multiple influence, because things that happen now show up in the future, we are kind of back to, as Vince said, the David uh, Ogilvy world of we're not always really sure, even though we were told that the digital age was gonna end the problem of attribution. If anything, it's probably compounded it. So really great, thank you guys for the, uh, the questions and thanks so much to our panelists for some really uh, great insights over dinner. So thank you guys, thanks. Thank you.